ready for the next talk, which is uh, focused on simultaneous metabolic fleeing and oxygen fleeing for Swarovski's lifetime imaging in biomedical researchers, which uh, uh, is presented by uh, Professor Angelika Hook and uh, Professor Wolfgang Becker. Angelika uh, studied chemistry at the University of Ulm and did her PhD in physical chemistry. For more than 20 years, she led the research um, of photodynamic therapy and advanced microscopy at the Institute uh, for Advanced Photonics and Optics in Ulm. Since seven, since seven years, uh, she held the position of the director of the core facility and bioimaging research group and uh, control and multi photon microscopy at the University of Ulm and is responsible for microscopic applications and developments in the field of biomedical research and molecular medicine. Uh, she is uh, scientific, uh, um, she, her scientific efforts are focused on new methods for time resolved luminescence spectroscopy and microscopy as FLIM, SLIM and uh, PLIM in living cell and organisms. Imaging of cell metabolism, bioengineering alternations, and oxygen level during tumor development, neurodegenerative, and other disease are incidental. And uh, Mr. Becker, Wolfgang Becker is a specialist in time resolve optical detection uh, techniques. I think that many of us heard his name and we shortly, I just say that's uh, why that's, uh, we heard her family, his family name specifically. He obtained his PhD uh, in 1979 in Berlin, Germany, and since uh, 1993, he is the head of Becker and Hickel uh, company in Berlin. His field of interest is development and, and application of advanced time correlated single photon counting techniques. He started to develop multidimensional TCSBC techniques in 1989, and I was a kid back then. And he's the originator of the TCSBC flint technique that is now widely used in uh, laser scanning microscopes. He is uh, the author of the BHTS uh, TCSBC handbook, which usually we call it in the community the Bible of Flynn now uh, out in the eighth edition and uh, uh, advanced single photon counting techniques uh, which is published in 2005 and he's also the editor uh, of the advanced single photon counting application in Springer which is published by Springer in 2015 and we are told that he likes cats skiing and fish one more so uh, Angelica and Wolfgang, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. I just mentioned your, the title of your talk again, Simultaneous Metabolic Flame and Oxygen Flame, Phosphorescence Lifetime Imaging in Biomedical Research. Please. Thank you, Ali, for this nice introduction. Thank you especially about the, for the remark about the cats. I really like cats, but you forgot that Angelica is a dog. So you can say Angelica and me <laughs> were like cat and dog. So it comes to me to give the first part of this presentation, which is the technical basis of metabolic flim. I will say some words about how we get metabolic information from flim of NADH and FAD. A lot of things have already been said about that here. Simultaneous detection of NAD and FAD, oxygen concentration measurement, and finally, simultaneous flim and plim. So the motivation of this all is, of course, sorry, it doesn't work. Okay. So the motivation of this is, of course, if we're looking at metabolic parameters, we are able to detect early alterations of metabolism. And this, these are usually some, some early stages of diseases. So we are able to de detect diseases before they actually cause damage to the, to the tissue or even to the whole organism, or in worst case, cause cancer. And 
it, if you if you ask the question whether phlegm is able to detect tumors or detect cancer, then the answer is usually yes. And, and then there comes a but. Some tumors have shorter lifetime than healthy tissue. Some tumors have longer lifetimes. So, and no one can really tell you why. The question is, are tumors just too heterogeneous or are there simple mistakes which cause this heterogeneity actually in the, in, in the, in the measurement results? So this is the question. And to, to find the answer for that, we, let's first look which natural fluorophores in biological tissue exist. There's quite a number. The interesting ones for us is NADH or NADPH and FAD. And the interesting thing is that these fluorophores are involved in the metabolism of the cell. And even more interesting, the decay functions of these compounds change with the metabolic state of the cell. So what happens in detail? I will make this short. So both fluorophores have a bound and an unbound component. For NADH, the unbound component is the fast one. For FAD, the bound component is the fast one. And as the metabolism changes from more, from, from more oxidative, that means uh, uh, oxidative phosphorylation, down to, to reductive, which is glycolysis, the decay curves change. And interestingly, they change in opposite directions. So I must warn you, there is disagreement about the exact mechanism of these changes, but there is actually, it's a matter of fact that the decay functions do change with the metabolic states. They can be modeled by a double exponential decay function. And the change is primarily in the amplitudes, not so much in the lifetimes of the decay components. So, and the, the other thing is, which is, this, this turns out to be very important, and it's actually also there is, there's no absolute agreement about that, but our, our own results actually bring direct evidence that the effect for NADH and FID goes in opposite directions. So what do we have to do to use these changes for metabolic phlegm? So of course, the first and most important point is, the NADH and the FAD signals must be cleanly separated. And second is A1 and A2 must be determined, not just an apparent lifetime or something like that. So therefore we need double exponential decay analysis, otherwise we can't obtain A1 and A2. And we need very clean decay data. We need the full fluorescence decay curve at high sensitivity, high accuracy, and with high time resolution. What we definitely don't need is extremely fast recording at high count rate for the simple reason we don't have such high count rates. We are dealing with autofluorescence, sometimes autofluorescence of single cells, and the count rates are naturally low. They are far below the count rates which are processable by TCSPC. So that means because we need sensitivity and time resolution, TCSPC and TCSPC FLIM is the method of choice. So how does it work? To make it short, we have a, a high frequency pulsed laser. We scan the sample with a, with a focused laser beam. The light goes to the detector. We're detecting single photons of the fluorescence light. For every photon, we determine the time in the fluorescence decay and the position of the laser beam in the moment of the photon detection. And from these parameters, we build up a photon distribution. And this photon distribution is our lifetime image. The advantage is we have near ideal efficiency of all the photons, which are seen by the detector end up in the result. The complete decay function is recorded at high, at, at high accuracy, not just in, in every pixel, not just the lifetime. And we have a beautiful time resolution. So the instrument response, which for our devices with our fastest detectors is less than 20 picoseconds. So the results, this is NADH flim with, with one of these fast detectors. This is the fluorescent lifetime image, the image of the mean amplitude weighted decay time, very clean data. Here's the fluorescence decay curve. And if we run double exponential analysis on these fast data, we obtain the amplitudes of the decay components and the, the, the lifetimes of the decay components 
almost at the same signal to noise ratio as a simple lifetime image. So this is good because we need this A1, A2. We don't want just a lifetime image which shows us what the average lifetime in the pixels is. So is this all? It works beautifully, but is it all? Of course not, because we, are, we, we want to record also information from the FAD. And that's the problem. Amazi Parasami already uh, told us something about that. The spectra, is, everything is overlapping there, overlapping excitation spectra, overlapping emission spectra. And to get this separated, obviously we can, NADH can only be excited here. We have to excite the NADH here around 350, 375 nanometers or the two photon equivalent of it detected here. And if we want to get a clean FAD signal, we have to excite here where we don't excite the NADH and detect it here. So I disagree a little bit with Amasi. Amasi thinks he can excite both at an average excitation wavelength. This may be true or not, but our experience is that this gives us the better data. And how can we do this? Of course, we want to record everything simultaneously. In uh, if we, This is live cell imaging and in live cells, everything can change from one minute to the next. So we have two lasers. We multiplex these lasers at a high multiplexing rate, high frequency. We have two TCSPC modules and every photon which is recorded is gets an identification number whether it's excited by laser one or laser two. And the result is actually that we record four images and two of these four images are the NADH image, the other one is the FAD image. So, and this is recorded simultaneously, very importantly. Here's an example. This is an NADH film image and this is an FAD film image recorded simultaneously with fast multiplexing of the laser. The decay functions are shown here. The data are good enough to run double exponential decay analysis. This is A1 of the NADH image. This is A1 of the FAD image. And here, this is from the border of a low grade tumor. This is a tumor cell. You see nicely as expected, A1 for this cell, for the tumor cell is higher than for the good cells. And in the FAD, the A1 is smaller than for the good cells, also as expected. So is this all? It's not all because I told you this the metabolism is actually that we have oxidative and reductive uh, metabolism and whether one or the other is active also depends on the oxygen concentrations. It would be nice to, de to determine the oxy oxygen concentration in the sample. And of course, it would be good to do this simultaneously with flim. So the question is, how can we record flim and flim simultaneously? The way to record oxygen concentration is phosphorescence. Phosphorescence goes via the triplet and the triplet in interacts with oxygen. That means if the oxygen concentration increases, the phosphorescence lifetime decreases. This is, you don't need special uh, phosphors for that. It works for every phosphorescence. Phosphorescence is always oxygen content sensitive. So, but here's a problem. Again, we want to record flim and flim simultaneously, but the fluorescence and phosphorescence lifetimes are in the one, one to 100 microseconds range compared to one nanosecond or so for, for flim. So we need low repetition rate for flim. For flim, it's known we need higher repetition rate. So the question is, can we excite simultaneously at high and low repetition rate? A biologi biologist or chemist will probably say, this is nonsense, impossible. There's only one repetition rate. The engineer, engineer says, no problem. Let's modulate the excitation. So we have our fast laser with short pulses, high repetition rate. We run it for some time, then we turn it off, then we run it again, then we turn it off. Then we have actually two repetition rates. The high rate here is here, and the low rate is the rate of this modulation, the on-off modulation. What we do then is we, we build up a flim image from the times within these fast pulses. This is the flim, the flim image. And we get a second image which uses the time within the modulation period. This is the flim image. 
this is the long time, this is, this is the short time. So simultaneously, again, simultaneously, we have flim and plim. Does it work? Yes, it works. This is a simple, simple test with yeast cells. I apologize, we don't have anything better here in the company. So here is the flim of the NADH in the yeast cells. And simultaneously, we stained the yeast cells with a ruthenium dye. So we see the phosphorescence here, and the phosphorescence lifetime gives us an information about the oxygen concentration. So actually, I, want, well, I was a bit fast because my plan was to give Angelica as much as possible time for the applications. So at the end, just a summary of the summary. So, okay, we have the tools at hand to do metabolic flim. So let's just go full steam ahead and do it. So, and with that, I pass the torch to Angelica and Angelica will continue with the applications of the technique. So thank you for, for your attention for this first part of the talk. Thank you. Okay, I think you have to so, hi, hi, Wolfgang. Someone has to <laughs> someone has to close your screen before I can't give free my screen. Ah, now it's working. Okay. And uh, imaging. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, and it looks good. It looks good, right. Okay. Also, first of all, thanks a lot for the organizers to invite me to this really wonderful meeting. And uh, as Wolfgang mentioned, I will give uh, the second part of the talk and I will speak about more about the photophysics, the biochemistry, algorithms and applications during simultaneous metabolic fluorescence lifetime imaging and oxygen blim. Uh, now, in metabolic flim, of course, as you all now know, the fluorescence lifetime is the important parameter, which is the reciprocal of all the rate constants, which uh, goes down from the first excited singlet state. However, due to intersystem crossing <clears throat> and to the triplet state, also a, a decay called phosphorescence is uh, possible for special molecules, which I will later on uh, describe in more detail. And from this, we can determine the so-called phosphorescence lifetime, <clears throat> which again is the reciprocal of all the rate constants. In that case, the phosphorescence rate and the quenching rate. And interestingly, this quenching rate comes mostly in nature from oxygen because oxygen is the most abundant quencher in nature for the triplet state. And from this, we can determine the uh, oxygen concentration by inspecting the phosphorescence lifetime of a so-called phosphor. This I will show on later on in more detail. Now, uh, Wolfgang and also the others in the interesting talks uh, mentioned the metabolic coenzymes which play a role in metabolic flim and I just want, would like to summarize what we are doing. We first of all measure uh, the fluorescence lifetime of NIDH. Uh, NIDH quite important which is fluorescent when it's in the reduced state. But besides NIDH, also the flavin group is quite important to measure uh, cell metabolism. And here we have to distinguish be mostly be mainly between two different molecules, FID, the flavin adenine dinucleotide, it's shown here. It possesses two chromophores, the adenine and the isoaloxacin ring. And also the FMN, which is here circled in green, the flavin mononucleotide. Both molecules possess uh, the same fluorescence characteristics. And also importantly, both are fluorescent in the oxidized state. However, the fluorescence quantum yield of FMN is about a factor of 10 compared to FID. And as we will see, the fluorescence lifetime is different for both molecules. Now, uh, these metabolic 
enzymes play a role in cell metabolism. Uh, there are two main processes a uh, cell can uh, get uh, or can produce ATP energy, and this is the anaerobic glycolysis, which takes place in the cytoplasm of the cells. In that case, NIDH plays a role, especially NIDH in a free state. Thus, a reduced cell uh, means that NIDH is free and we have anaerobic metabolism, also called glycolysis. Uh, the main uh, one of the main processes, but however, the, an, the aerobic process is oxidative phosphorylation, which takes place in the mitochondrial membrane in the so called respiratory chain reaction. In that case, NIDH is oxidized to NID, and also FMN and FID plays an important role. And what is also quite important in one of the last steps of the respiratory chain oxygen is reduced to water and it would be very interesting to measure this oxygen and we can do this as we will later on see by doing phosphorescence lifetime imaging. Now we can summarize an oxidized cell means uh, that oxidative phosphorylation is the most important reaction. NIDH is bound to proteins. We have an aerobic metabolism and uh, we have also FMN and FID involved, but their role is more complex and I will discuss this later on. Uh, just to summarize, uh, during glycolysis, during the anaerobic process, we have free NIDH. And importantly, NIDH, when it's free, it possesses a short fluorescence lifetime. This was also mentioned uh, in some talks today. And when it's bound to protein, it possesses a much longer lifetime, around 2.5 nanoseconds. Now, uh, when oxidative phosphorylation decreases and we have more reduced cells, this means we have more free NIDH and the lifetime is getting short. Because we always have a mixture between uh, bound and unbound NIDH, we have to do a multi-exponential fitting procedure for NIDH, especially a 2B uh, exponential fitting procedure. And from this, we get the lifetimes of the short component and of the long component, and also the so-called relative amplitude, the weighting factors of both components. Now, during oxidative phosphorylation, as I mentioned, NIDH is bound and the lifetime is getting long. But uh, we have also FMN involved and FID uh, involved during uh, oxidative phosphorylation. And now very important, this was also mentioned by Wolfgang, uh, free FID has a long fluorescence lifetime. This is an opposite to uh, the lifetime of NIDH when it's free. Whereas bound FID has a very short fluorescence lifetime between 100 and 300 picoseconds. But we have also FMN and FMN bound interestingly has a very long fluorescence lifetime between 4.5 uh, and 6 nanoseconds. And uh, because we have at least three different components, we will see that we normally do a three exponential fitting procedure to get all the different components for FID and FMN. Yes, uh, during when glycolysis decreases and oxidative phosphorylation increases, we get more uh, oxidized cell. This means that bound NIDH increases and the lifetime of NIDH is getting longer. But what's about FID and FMN? And we will later on see what's going on with these uh, flavin molecules. Because FID and FMN also play an important role in bioenergetics, and this was also mentioned today, I just want to show you FMN plays a role in the so-called complex one of the respiratory chain. The first step is a reduction of FMN to FMNH2, and FID plays a role in complex two of the respiratory chain. Also, in that case, the first step is a reduction of FID to FIDH2. And this makes it very complicated to, to see uh, what's going on uh, with the lifetimes during glycolysis and during oxidative phosphorylation. There was also a question about the uh, quantitative flavine contents and therefore I inserted uh, very quickly this uh, slide because there was a discussion in one of the talks before. Um, we have 
there are cells which distinguish which uh, distinguish the FMN and FID content, and we can see that our special cells which have a lot of FMN inside uh, concentration, and also a high concentration of FID. So uh, it really depends on the cell type, on the cell state, how much FID and how much FMN is working, and how much uh, they these cells uh, have in, in inside the mitochondrial membrane. Um, because this is also complicated, uh, new algorithms has to be developed and new algorithms determine the energy metabolism in vivo. The oldest metabolism, which has nothing to do with uh, fluorescence lifetime, was defined more than 40 years ago by Britain Chance. He defined the so-called so optical redox ratio, which is the fluorescence intensity relation between reduced NIDH and oxidized FID and he defined that uh, it increases when glycolysis increases that's as more the cell gets reduced the redox ratio is increasing now some years ago and this was mentioned by um, Amasi Periyasami in his talk and also by others the so-called FLIR index was defined the fluorescence lifetime uh, induced redox ratio, which now means the amount of bound NIDH uh, divided by the amount of bound FID. In that case, and that was found by uh, Amasi Periyasami, as more oxidized the cell gets, as more oxidative phosphorylation the cell is doing, as uh, longer, uh, as, as, um, as more uh, the FLIR index is getting. So uh, there's an increase an observed an increase in the FLIR index when the cell is getting more oxidized. Also important is the OMI index, which was uh, developed, which was introduced by the group of Melissa Scala, and they used a mixed match of all of, uh, of the intensity-based redox ratio, the mean lifetime of NIDH, and also the mean lifetime of FID. What we will see uh, later on is that there is another uh, index, it's called the NIDH metabolic index, it's also a FLIM based index, which relates unbound NIDH to bound NIDH, and which also gives a very nice index uh, to uh, measure uh, metabolic states. In all cases, what, what I present here, every time a B ex, at least a B exponential fitting is required. And as we will see for FID, even a three exponential fitting is required. Now, just to give you an example of some beautiful slides, which we got some uh, years ago together with the neurological depart department in Ulm. We did some advanced metabolic NIDH FLIM measurements in neurological disorders. And we were especially interested how uh, we can uh, see uh, the influence of Alzheimer's disease uh, to cell metabolism. And it's known that a protein called APP, a transmembrane uh, protein in the mitochondrial membrane, when it's cleaved and A beta is produced, that this A beta can inhibit complex one of the respiratory chain. Now, uh, we can see here hex cells, which were not treated, and we can see here in the single dots, the single uh, mitochondria of the cells. And uh, when these hex cells uh, got uh, overexpression of APP, the fluorescence lifetime in the, inside these um, um, mitochondria was uh, very much decreased because of a switch of cell metabolism due to inhibiting complex one of the respiratory chain. Whereas when these cells were co-expressed with a uh, gamma secretase inhibitor, which inhibits the cleavage of this APP, we got again normal cells. So we can nicely follow up cell uh, um, metabol metabolic switches in, inside the cells due to by inspecting the fluorescence lifetime of NIDH. This was also shown in uh, neurons in primary primary neurons, which we got from, uh, from a rat brain. And we also could see nicely uh, switches in these neurons. Um, I want to speak about a little bit about the uh, NIDH metabolic index, this index, uh, which means 
uh, a one divided by a, a two. And there was a nice uh, work uh, some years ago by uh, Hauk Stutier and co-workers. And they, follow, they followed up this uh, metabolic index during tumor development under uh, the skin of, a, of, a, of the ear of a mice. And what we have, what they could uh, see that uh, on the skin above this tumor, that this metabolic index changed. The metabolic index uh, was getting uh, was enhanced during the tumor development, which means that there was more glycolysis. So this metabolic index is quite interesting and quite significant to follow up metabolic changes during tumor development. Um, because I mentioned NI, uh, the FID and the FMN, I, of course, I also wanted, want to show you some examples about the FLIR index, which again means uh, the relation between bound NIDH and bound FID. In that case, of course, one needs to measure NIDH and FID simultaneously. And we heard from uh, Amasi Periyasami and also from Wolfgang Becker that it is very important to spectrally separate very well NIDH and FID to get clear and clean signals. So what we uh, did here, we in that case, we excited NIDH by two photon excitation at 730 nanometer and FID at 80 nanometer with two photon excitation. And the detection was for NIDH around 460 nanometer and for FID around uh, 530 nanometer. What we found here that for cancerous cells, in that case, squamous carcinoma cells, that the lifetime of uh, FID and of NIDH was, uh, was um, decreasing compared to the uh, lifetime when we, when, we, when we observed it, when we used TACAT normal cells. So the lifetime increased from cancerous cells to keratinocytes, as well as for FID and NIDH. And these results were consistent with the so-called FLIR index, which was defined by uh, Amasi Periyasami. For uh, when observing NIDH, FID, and FMN simultaneously, we have to make the right fitting procedure. So we tested different fittings. Now, uh, as I mentioned, normally we do a multi-exponential fitting after detecting the fluorescence decay after exciting with a short laser pulse. So in case of NIDH, we normally do a a B exponential fit to get the free the, com the free compound and the bound compound. And we got the lifetimes of the free and of the bound uh, compound and also the relative amplitudes. What we found that we got the best the best fit when we do uh, when we fix our lifetime tau one and tau two and just and just uh, calculate uh, the amplitudes A1 and A2. So normally what we do for NIDH, we fix our lifetimes for the short component and for the long component. And with this, we get the best results. What are we doing when we, when we uh, fit the flavines? For the flavines, we know that the, uh, the lifetime consists at least on bound and unbound FID and also on FMN. Therefore, we are now doing normally a three exponential fitting procedure for bound FID, for free FID, and for FMN. And we, when, and we tried to, uh, to use different fitting procedures to see which is the best fitting procedure. So we did it with a, a free fitting procedure where we, where we had free, a free fit of the different lifetimes and also of the different amplitudes. And then we fixed our lifetimes uh, to different uh, values. And I will show you the uh, results uh, later on. So here I can show you the fit of our FID, FM and FLIM in our tumor cells, in the squamous carcinoma cells, whereas our HACAT cells with different fitting procedures. When we did a free fit, so we, we fitted everything, every parameter free, uh, as well as the lifetimes and also uh, the amplitudes, we, we found that our tau mean of FID was significantly different for the SEC, for the tumor cells and for the HACAT cells. 
The HACAT <coughs> cells showed a longer lifetime compared to the SEC4 cells. Also, our amplitudes A1 and A2 uh, showed a significant difference. However, our uh, A3, which correlates to FMN, did not uh, significantly differ for our tumor and HACAT cells. However, when we fixed our lifetimes uh, to, uh, for example, tau 1 to 250 picoseconds, tau 2 to 1,400 picoseconds, tau 3 to 5,000 picoseconds, we got a significant difference in this relative amplitudes for A1, for A2, and for A3. Again, A1 for bound FID, A2 for free FID, and A3, A3 for FMN. So in uh, conclusion, uh, in case of our HACAT of our normal cells, bound FID decreases, which correlates with increased oxidative phosphorylation and bound FMN also increases. Now coming back to our indices, which are determine our uh, metabolic state. <clears throat> so for this, we compared the significance of our NIDH metabolic index again, uh, the A1 of bound NI, uh, of free NIDH divided by the amplitude of uh, bound NIDH. And we compare this with our FLIR index. And we uh, define different FLIR indices, the so-called FLIR1, which is uh, bound NIDH divided by bound FID, the so-called classical FLIR index, which was also defined by, by Amasi Periasami. But in addition, we also defined a uh, FLIR2 and FLIR3. Uh, FLIR2, uh, which is bound NIDH divided by free FID, and FLIR3, which is bound NIDH divided by FMN. And what we found when we compared all these indices for all the different fitting procedures, that our FLIR1 uh, index is the statistically most significant, which means that there is a need to measure NIDH and FID simultaneously. So in conclusion for, the, uh, for uh, cell metabolism uh, and the significance of our NIDH metabolic index versus the FLIR indices, our uh, index uh, FLIR1 is the most significant. So this is the first part of my talk. And I, because I, I promised also to speak about phosphorescence lifetime imaging, the last slides will deal with phosphorescence lifetime imaging and later on with simultaneous flim and blim measurements. As I mentioned, phosphorescence lifetime imaging is able to detect oxygen concentration because oxygen concentration is inversely proportional to the phosphorescence lifetime of a phosphor. This is the so-called Stern-Wolmer equation. And from this, this we can follow then by, by, uh, follow, by follow up the phosphorescence lifetime that we can follow up oxygen, oxygen consumption and oxygen uh, concentration. Now, what are good phosphors? Phos good phosphors are complexes uh, with central transition metal ions from subgroups with lower unoccupied or single occupied orbitals. Uh, these are molecules which comes from the so-called or metals which come from the so-called platinum group. This is the eight to ten subgroup uh, um, in the in the uh, in the in the, uh, the subgroup which which consists of ruthenium, osmium, rhodium, iridium, palladium, and platinum. And uh, why is this so? Uh, all these uh, all these molecules which have this uh, central atoms have a so-called metal ligand uh, charge transfer state in the triplet state, which is able to phosphoresce, which is able to phosphoresce. Uh, this is because of this uh, spin orbit coupling of, of the triplet state. <clears throat> and uh, this uh, phosphorescence can be used to observe oxygen concentration. I will show you some examples. Um, we did some oxygen blim measurements uh, with a photo with a special photosensitizer, which is also able to phosphoresce. And this photosensitizer is called TLD1433. 
it was uh, developed by a company in uh, Toronto. This company is uh, called Terra Lace. And this dye has a ruthenium atom as a central atom. It's a complicated dye. You can see different aromatic groups around this ruthenium atom. And interestingly, this dye is a phospho uh, photosensitizer, which is used in photodynamic therapy, but it's also a phosphorescent dye, which can be used as, a, as an oxygen sensor. <clears throat> So for this, we did also two photon excitation here at 780 nanometer and detected the phosphorescence above 615 nanometer. And we can see here at, uh, in, at normoxic uh, conditions, so with 21% oxygen, these are all living cells, that uh, the phosphorescence lifetime, you can see it here, is quite short. What is short for phosphorescence lifetime? It's of course, much higher than uh, fluorescence lifetime, but it's uh, between 1200 and 1300 nanoseconds, so it's in the microsecond range. Now, when we induced hypoxic conditions here for 1% oxygen, we got a significant increase of the phosphorescence lifetime due to the reciprocal relation of oxygen and the phosphorescence lifetime. So the phosphorescence lifetime is now around 1.7 microseconds. And uh, from, from this, there's a linear behavior. We behave between uh, oxygen concentration and the phosphorescence lifetime. We can determine the oxygen concentration inside the cells. Now we were much interested. Our, so this is the photochemistry of TLD1433. You can see again <clears throat> excitation to the first excited um, singlet state, which is a metal-like charge transfer state. After inter-system crossing, this triplet state is reached. And this is uh, the decay from which oxygen concentration can be determined, the phosphorescence uh, decay, the phosphorescent decay where the phosphorescence lifetime is uh, enlarged when oxygen is consumed. And what is quite interesting, we have other different triplet states. This is a molecule has a quite a complicated photochemistry. And these triplet states can induce uh, phototoxic rea reactions, which, which destroys the cells, which is used in photodynamic therapy for, for, cancer, uh, for cancer cell destruction. And the interesting th thing is that we can follow up oxygen concentration during photodynamic therapy of this dye, which, was, which is shown here on this slide. Here we did simultaneous NIDH flim measurements together with TLD flim measurements. This uh, work was really, or these measurements were really done simultaneously as was explained before by Wolfgang Becker by modulating the laser beam. And during the so-called on phase of the laser, we measured the fluorescence lifetime of NIDH. During the so-called off phase of the laser, we measured the phosphorescence lifetime of this TLD. And what we could nicely correlate were uh, sites in the cells with a very low oxygen concentration with, with a high phosphorescence lifetime or with a long phosphorescence lifetime and uh, sites in the cell where the fluorescence lifetime of NIDH was very low. Thus, the low uh, fluorescence lifetime of NIDH correlates, correlates well with the long phosphorescence lifetime of TLD and with a very uh, low oxygen concentration, which means that oxygen was consumed in those sites. We did uh, similar experiments with another phosphorescent truck, <clears throat> and this is a truck which is based on iridium as a central atom. Uh, iridium complexes are also very nice phosphors, which we can uh, see here. So when we have uh, normoxic conditions, the phosphorescence lifetime is low, whereas when we have hypoxic conditions, the phosphorescence lifetime is getting much longer. But compared to these ruthenium complexes, these iridium complexes are much more photostable and are not, photo uh, are not uh, 
are not phototoxic, it has no phototoxic activity. So we were interested if our NIDH film is also changing, if the lifetime of NIDH is also changing upon uh, incubation with, uh, with this um, iridium complex and what we, could, what we could show that the NIDH lifetime was only very slightly changing upon uh, incubation with this iridium complex, which means that this iridium complex is, is much more photostable. And for this, we can conclude that, that these iridium complexes are very nice drugs just to follow up oxygen changes without inducing any phototoxicity because it's much more photostable. Um, this was shown uh, before by Wolfgang Becker, so I can I think I can skip this slide. It again shows, our, but it uh, shows our apparatus. We excite simultaneously <clears throat> our ourselves at 780 and 880 nanometer in our microscope. We have now a three-channel flim flim system with three different high bright detectors. And using the right filter combination, we can distinguish between NIDH flim. FID flim and also in the red channel plim of a special phosphor. The, the technique of plim was uh, uh, mentioned and was explained by Wolfgang, so I can go over this and I can come to my summary because I think my time is over. Uh, I discussed functional imaging with time-resolved luminescence microscopy, especially with simultaneous flim plim to investigate cell metabolism, redox state in oxygen sensing in cell biology and biomedical research by observing NIDH flim, FID, FM, and flim using various algorithms, algorithms in oxygen sensing and oxygen consumption by phosphorescence lifetime imaging of different phosphors. And last but not least, I would like to thank my group and my, corporate, my, my corporation, the corporation of the neurology department. <clears throat> and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. Uh, really informative. Uh, Angelica and Wolfgang, thank you very much. Really informative talk. Uh, I just go fast through the questions, if that's okay. Uh, we actually received two questions in the beginning of talk, which I assume they refer to um, Sebeke. Is the first one is that what is the spectral range you are looking at in this image? That was uh, that's from Gerhard Holz. Maybe that's uh, Gerhard. You can actually uh, unmute. Uh, your microphone and then uh, explain which image you mean was that related to this talk or another talk oh it, it was it was the first part of the talk uh where wolfgang becker showed his first um, very colorful uh lifetime distribution i just wanted to know um what the spectral range was uh, in which this lifetime distribution was recorded or measured Microsome? Yes. So the, in the first image, this was the, the NADH image, we excited with two photon excitation at something like 760 nanometers. And the detection range for, FAD, for NADH is something like 420 up to 475. No higher. If you go higher, you start detecting FAD, which is inevitably also excited. excited. And then your results actually going to the hill, everything becomes uh, unpredictable because the effects go in opposite directions. So, in other words, to make it short, 420 to 475. The second question actually is from you as well, is that how long is the recording of these images in terms of total uptake time? Well, so, so the question is that how long it takes? It, this, Again, was, from Gerhard. this was referring to the combination of uh, Phosphorescence lifetime and and fluorescence lifetime. I just wanted to get a feeling how how long such a recording takes. Okay, okay. Uh, it can be done in twenty seconds. Do you hear me? Yeah, it, it, we are it, hearing it, you. it can <laughs> be done in twenty seconds. So it does not take much longer than doing just flim alone. Um, it's because it's really simultaneous, a simultaneous measurement. Okay. 
it, it depends on the signal noise ratio, but it can be done in 20 seconds. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. And uh, so we go to the question from Mariano Gonzalez Crispil. Uh, how long does it take to take a flame plus flame simultaneous image? That's actually an interesting question. I had this question as well. It's Since we are going to modulate the uh, repetition of the lasers, of how long that takes, uh, maybe that it would be one question that per peak cell, and also that he mentioned that, for example, how long for the yeast cell example. Maybe, uh, Wolfgang, can you uh, answer? Or I, 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 I didn't understand it very well, uh, just sarcastically. So if it's, it's again the acquisition time, or what was it? Yeah, that's actually when the, the question is about uh, simultaneous flame and flame imaging. Uh, how long that takes uh, to acquire one image, one flame so you, and flame it's image? Exactly the same as Angelica said. So it doesn't take much longer than to take a, a flame image. Of course, it, every, it, it always comes down to the question, how many photons can you get from your sample without killing it? How many pixels do you want in your image? Of course, this is it's trivial. And the other thing is, it, it works pretty well for the ruthenium dyes because the phosphorescence decay times are on the order of, of one or a couple of microseconds. If you use iridium with a, a phosphorescence decay time of 100 microseconds or so, then you have to scan slowly because the pixel time must be longer than the phosphorescence decay mm -hmm. time. And then your scan is very slow, but it, the, the effect is mitigated by the effect that uh, by, by the fact that you can run just one single scan over the image. One single scan is the same as many fast scans. So all in all, normally you are done within less than a minute. Uh, actually, I just uh, use this privilege that I'm sharing this session. Uh, the one specific question regarding this one, that's the pixel dwell time you are uh, suggesting for when we are using iridium, uh, which has the first phosphorescence lifetime of about a microsecond. So it would be something like six microseconds is enough. Yes, yeah, some, something like five times longer than the phosphorescence decay. Okay, so that says there's uh, the same rule of thumb that we have for the flame, the pixel yes. dwell time, yes. or the decay time on the okay, repetition time. Okay, thank you. So we go to the next question is um, from Connie Vetska. Thanks for your talk. Uh, that's, um, uh, the question is for uh, Angelica, how toxic are your plain dyes for your cells and tissues? I think that uh, you mentioned that uh, specifically regarding the yes, radio. I, can I can answer this because of, because of the short time. I couldn't show the slide. Of course, we have determined uh, toxicity and also phototoxicity. And uh, I can tell you that these dyes are not very toxic. So about 40 micromolar are not toxic. So of course, if you take a 100 micromolar or more, this, uh, the, the dye gets toxic. But I can, I can send you the exact uh, data if you, if you are interested in. Uh, that would be great. Uh, if you can share it with us, we actually can send it to the participants as well. That's one. Additional remark here is Wolfgang, Connie, nice to hear you here or to see you. So, of course, this is it's understandable that there's concern about toxicity because, in fact, the, the quenching effect of the phosphorescence is creation of singlet oxygen. So, in singlet oxygen, it's not quite healthy to the cells, but in comparison to photodynamic therapy, where, where they're creating just a very, very little singlet oxygen. So effectively, you don't see any 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 light-induced cell tests or anything. Anything I can confirm this, but the concern is certainly justified. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the last question that I want to ask this session is that, in your experience, is it possible to use TLD dye? or iridium complexes together with an ATP sensor to follow the metabolic state of a single cell, which would be the major hurdles? It's from uh, Georgia Bulli. Um, TLD, it's not, a, as I know, it's not fluorescing. Uh, and so uh, it, it, I'm not sure if it's really possible. Mm -hmm. It does not. Uh, if does not uh, 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 quench or if does not influence our our fluorescence and our phosphorescence too much. So we we haven't tried it yet. That's a correct answer. 
I have no experience by using the TLD dye together with the iridium complexes or together with an ATP sensor. So, and I'm, sh I'm sorry, but I can't really answer this. Um, what we have done in the, in the past, we just um, measured the phototoxicity or the, the toxic uh, irradiation uh, of different laser beams. And for this, we also have used different dyes to measure uh, the, the response on the cells. But we have never done this in conjunction with uh, phosphorescence lifetime imaging with the iridium complexes. So I can't, I can't answer this question, sorry. Uh, there are two more, two more questions left, which uh, I'll say these questions to you and uh, kindly asking you to respond to that and then we can share it with the people. So there is one from Andre and Gerard Hoss. It's quite late, so we are something like 20 minutes past the time that we had. Uh, I would like to thank you all. And the, all the uh, speakers that in the last two days uh, they have presented in the uh, sessions, in the scientific talk sessions, just name them very fast. Uh, Stephanie Weitkamp Peters, Yvonne Stahl, Carson Grasshoff, Alessandro Esposito, Sumit Wahila uh, on the first day. And today, Yuri uh, Progazov, Werner uh, Zuschrata, Gerhard Holz, Amazi Priyazami, uh, Rupsadatta, and uh, Wolfgang Becker and Angelika Wood. Thank you all of you uh, for sharing your knowledge and enhancing and understanding uh, through this 10 uh, scientific talk. And we are looking to see all of you in last three, the next three days where we are having the practicals, the hands-on sessions, virtual hands-on sessions. That would be an experience. It's actually new for us as well. We would like uh, just to express this one and uh, hopefully we manage to do that. So let's see how does that turns out. We are finishing 2020, that would be an experience. Thank you very much. Looking forward to all of you and have a nice uh, afternoon, evening, maybe late evening and hopefully see you in the next three days. Bye. Bye. Bye.